Hello everyone, welcome to the course uh, Expansive Soil. This will be the 19th lecture and it will be the module 7. I will start a new chapter, the treatment of expansive soil. We know that expansive soil has a lot of problems like low shear strength, lower value of hydraulic conductivity and higher compressibility. So when we construct any structure on an expansive soil, it will undergo a large amount of settlement. Therefore, it is not advisable or not convenient to construct any kind of engineering structure before modification of an expansive soil. In this class, we will learn about what are the different methods to treat an expansive soil before going for any type of construction. In this class, I will explain about the mechanical methods which are generally used for treatment of expansive soil. Before going into the details, we would like to know what are the different objectives of any ground modification of an expansive soil or what are the different objectives for the ground modification for an expansive soil. The number one is to increase the shear strength as we know that shear strength of an expansive soil is very less therefore it will have a very less bearing capacity. So first objective is to increase its shearing strength thereby increase its bearing capacity. The second one to reduce the compressibility. As we know that the expansive soil contains a lot of water in it. Therefore, it will be highly compressible. In this objective, we will reduce the compressibility of the soil such that the settlement due to a load will be minimum for an expansive soil. And also the expansive soil undergoes large amount of swelling and shrinkage. The swelling and shrinkage produce differential settlement or differential heaving and that leads to the damage to the structure. So therefore, it is quite essential to control the swelling and the shrinkage. Therefore, the third objective of any ground modification related to expansive soil is to control its swelling and the shrinkage behavior. And the fourth one is to control its permeability and the pore water pressure. As the permeability of an expansive soil is very less, therefore the water will take lot of time to dissipate from it or the pore water pressure takes lot of time to get dissipated. Therefore, it will undergo the settlement for a large time and hence the last objective of ground modification technique for an expansive soil is to control its permeability so that the settlement can be achieved in a less time. When we talk about different type of modification of an expansive soil, mostly all these methods can be grouped into four different groups. The first one is a mechanical modification. The second one is a hydraulic modification or hydraulic method. Third one is a chemical method and the fourth one is by inclusion or confinement. Under the mechanical modification method, we apply a load such that the soil will undergo compaction. So this process can be performed in terms of compaction, preloading or stone columns. Under the hydraulic modification me method, we will accelerate the flow of water through the soil such that the settlement of the soil will take place quickly and also it, it will gain some shear strength. This can be achieved by providing vertical drains or by vacuum consolidation or electrokinetic dewatering. In the chemical method, we add some chemicals to the soil thereby increasing its strength. So these methods are the lime stabilization, grouting, cement stabilization, fly ash stabilization. In the fourth method, we include some kind of inclusion or confinement or we provide some inclusion or confinement to the soil in the form of soil nailing or geosynthetics. So when we use soil nailing or geosynthetic, the strength of the soil will increase. So these are the different methods by which we can modify it or increase the strength of an expansive soil. We will start with the mechanical method first. As the name suggests, mechanical method is a process of densifying the soil by application of a load and this load can be a short term load and it will be applied through a 
through an external mechanism or an external mechanical forces. Generally, the compaction can be used to densify the soil. In the mechanical method, the density of the soil can be increased by application of a short term external mechanical forces which include the compaction. Compaction can be carried out by a static method or a vibratory methods or an impact method. Generally, when you talk about compaction, compaction can be performed for a shallow depth or for a large depth. So, I will discuss all the methods one by one. Compaction and consolidations are generally two different processes used for mechanical modification of the soil. In the compaction process, the densification of the soil occurs due to the expulsion of the air, whereas in consolidation process, the volume decrease of the soil takes place because of the expulsion of water. Compaction takes place for an unsaturated soil, whereas consolidation takes place for a saturated soil. We will discuss about the different compaction process. Compaction is a process of densifying the soil by application of mechanical energy. In this process, the soil particles are gets compacted and it will be packed in a closely dense manner such that their density will get increased. When the density of the soil gets increased, its shear strength also will get increased. Here we can see this is a soil before the compaction, we can see the soil has uh, three phase, one is air, water and the solid particles. When we compact the soil, the volume decrease takes place because of the reduction in the air from the soil. So, here we can see after the compaction, the volume decrease is taking place only because of the expulsion of the air. We need to do the compaction process to increase the shear strength, the bearing capacity and increase the stability of the soil and also Will, when we do the compaction, it will reduce the compressibility and the permeability of the soil. The compaction process has different advantages. It increases the soil strength, it increases the load bearing capacity and it reduces the settlement, it reduces the permeability of the soil and it reduces the soil swelling and shrinkage characteristics and it increases the soil stability. So, when we do a compaction process, all the different objectives we can achieve that is with we get a soil with a higher strength, higher bearing capacity, less settlement, less permeability, less swelling and shrinkage mechanism and a higher value of soil stability. Before going for a compaction in the field, we have to take out the soil sample from the field to the laboratory and we need to determine the maximum dry density and the optimum moisture content. That means, what should be the maximum density which we can achieve in the field and at what water content. Generally, this is carried out by two different process. One is called standard Proctor test and another one is a modified Proctor test. Depending on the load how much coming to the structure at the site, either we can decide to go by the standard Proctor test or modified Proctor test. If the load coming to the structure is less, then we can go for standard Proctor test. Say in generally a residential building or any highway construction, at the same time, if the load coming to the structure is quite high, say for example, runway in an airfield, in that case, we can go with a modified Proctor test. Both the methods are almost identical. In a standard Proctor test, we need to take a mold of volume 1000 cc and a rammer which will be of having a weight 2.6 kilogram and it will fall from a height of 310 millimeter. The soil can be compacted in three different layers and each layer will be compacted with a 25 number of blows. Here we can see this is a rammer of weight 2.6 kilogram in case of a standard Proctor test. And this is the mold which will have a volume of 1000 cc. And when you do a compaction, we will get the plot between the dry density and water content. 
in the compaction process whether it is a standard proctor or modified proctor we need to take the soil sample at different water content and then we need to determine the dry density of the soil corresponding to those water content. Once we get the dry density then we will plot a graph to get the compaction curve. So, here we are having the compaction curve. This is also we can get for a modified proctor test. Modified proctor test is almost identical with the standard proctor test. Only thing is we have to take a different weight 4.9 kilogram which will fall from a height of 450 mm and the soil will be compacted in 5 different layers and each layer will be given a 25 number of blows. So, similarly for the standard proctor test we need to take the soil sample at different water content and then we need to do the test and determine the dry density for the corresponding water content and then we will get the curve. Depending on whether we are having a standard proctor test or modified proctor test, we will get the different results. Here we can see this is a general shape of a compaction curve. Initially it will increase with the water content and after reaching a peak value, the den dry density will decrease. The maximum dry density which we can achieve is known as the MDD or maximum dry density of a soil corresponding to that method. Say for example, this is the standard proctor method and this is the MDD corresponding to the standard proctor test method. And similarly, the water content corresponding to that maximum dry density is known as optimum moisture content. Similarly, for a modified proctor test, we can get the maximum dry density and the optimum moisture content. So, depending on which method we are dealing with or we are performing the test, the MDD OMC value will be different. Once we know the MDD and OMC value, then we need to specify that to what water content or what density the soil has to be compacted in the field. And we know that there are two zone in a compaction curve, one is known as dry of OMC and another one is known as weight of OMC. If this is a compaction curve and if we draw a vertical line, the portion on the left side of this line is known as dry OMC. That means the water content on this portion will be less than the OMC or dry of OMC because it will be less. So, it is called dry of OMC. Similarly, on this side, on the right side of this line, the water content will be higher. So, that is why it is known as weight of OMC. Depending on whether we are compacting on the dry side of the OMC or wet side of the OMC, the different properties of the soil will be different. Here we can see that if we take the structure of the soil, when we compact the soil on the dry of OMC, it will be flocculated structure and wet of OMC, it will be a dispersed structure. The water deficiency of the soil compacted on dry of OMC will be high and compacted on wet of OMC will be low. The permeability of the soil compacted on dry of OMC will be high and weight of OMC will be low. The compressibility will be different depending on the stress condition, whether it is a low stress or high stress. If the stress is low, then on the dry side of the OMC, the compressibility will be low and at high stress, it will be high. On the wet side of the OMC, the compressibility for low stress will be high and for high stress, it will be low. The swelling characteristics will be high compacted on dry side of the OMC and low for the soil compacted on the wet side of the OMC. The shrinkage will be low for the soil compacted on dry side of the OMC and high for the soil compacted on the wet side of the OMC. The soil will be behave like brittle and it will show a high peak value if the soil is compacted on dry side of the OMC and it will behave like a ductile if it is compacted on the wet side of the OMC and it will not exhibit any peak in comparison to if the soil is compacted on the wet side of the OMC. So, depending on the structure, we can suggest whether to compact the soil on the dry side of the OMC or on the wet side of the OMC. Once we know that this is the dry density and this is the optimum moisture content 
or this is the density at which we need to compact the soil in the field, then the soil will be compacted in the field using different methods. When you talk about the field compaction, the field compaction or the soil can be compacted in two ways. One is known as shallow compaction or surface compaction and the other one is known as the deep compaction. In the shallow compaction or on the surface compaction, the soil present on the surface or few feet below the surface will be compacted. On the other hand, if we need to compact the soil located at a large depth, then we have to go with the deep compaction method. Depending on whether we are using the shallow compaction or deep compaction, the equipment will be also be different. First, we will go with the shallow compaction method. The shallow compaction of a soil can be performed using a roller or rammer and this type of compaction generally performed using a static method or a or by a vibratory method. So, depending on whether it is static or vibratory forces, the equipment will also be different which I will be explaining one by one. The first I will discuss about the rollers. Rollers can be of various type. So, I will discuss about few type of rollers over here. The first one is a sheep foot roller. Here you can see it is an example of a sheep foot roller. The sheep foot roller is consisting of a drum, a large drum over here having a large number of round or rectangular shaped protrusion which are known as the feet. So, these protrusions are known as the feet and the area of each feet can vary from 30 to 80 centimeter square and it is cover a, an area of about 8 to 12 percent and this type of roller is generally used for a fused, used for compacting the cohesive soil such as heavy clays and silt but this will not be useful for a sandy soil. When we use this roller due to this small area of this feet, the roller will apply a large amount of pressure to the soil. Therefore, the soil can be compacted to a large extent and this is applicable for clay soil and silty soils as I told earlier. Because if we use the other kind of soil due to their stickiness of behavior, the clay will stick to the surface of the other type of rollers. Therefore, it will not be able to compact properly. Hence, to compact the clay type of soil, we need to have a sheaf foot roller. Generally, the thickness of the compacting layer is about 5 centimeter more than the length of each foot and the factors which governs the amount of compaction are weight of roller, the area of each foot the number of fits then the maximum pressure exerted on a soil when the foot is vertical. So, these are the different uh, factors which governs the amount of compaction to the soil and generally 10 to 20 number of passes are required to give a complete coverage to the soil and this type of compaction generally uses the kneading as well as the static action for compacting the soil. And mostly because of this high stress generated by the small sur surface area of this protrusion of the feet, the soil can get compacted to a large density. These rollers compact the soil by combination of tamping and kneading action. When the roller is passed for the first time, the projection will penetrate into the soil layer and the lower portion of the layer is compacted. 
and in su successive passes the compaction is obtained in the middle and top portion of the layer. That means if we take a surface like this, when this protrusion penetrate into the soil, the soil present in this portion will get compacted first and then it will move like this one and then in the successive layer the soil compacted like this. The depth of the layer that can be compacted depends upon the length of the, pro of the projection and weight of the roller. The smaller ro roller can, be comp can compact layers up to 15 centimeter thickness whereas heavy rollers can compact layers up to 30 centimeter thickness. And furthermore, the load of this roller can further be increased by putting some ballast or sand inside this drum. The pressure of the feet may be increased by filling the drum with wet sand and some other material. And once the load on the drum is increased, the pressure on each feet will also increase. So here you can see this is a contact area of this feet. Since the area is less, it will it will exert a large amount of pressure and therefore the soil will be compacted effectively. It has certain advantages. This is more suitable for cohesive soil. The feet produces kneading action. It increases the blending of the soil. The soil can get mixed quite easily and the possible soil compaction over a wide range of moisture content. This is applicable to compact the soil for a wide range of water content. But it has certain disadvantages like the process is very slow and the density which we can achieve will be less in comparison to other method and large amount of untapped air will also be present because between the protrusion there will be the airs present over here. So that may reduces the amount of compaction or the density of the soil. And we need to remember that for a clay soil this is the most suitable method for compaction as it uses the kneading as well as the static and tamping action for compaction. The next one is a smooth wheel roller. So this type of roller generally consisting of a large drum which will be in front of that and also one or two number of drums on the back side. So it is consisting of a large steel drum in front and one or two wheel drums on the rear end. This roller can be tandem ro roller or can be a three wheel roller. In tandem roller, it will have a two drums, one will be at the front and one will be at the back. Whereas in three wheel roller, there will be one drum at the front side and two wheel at the rear end of the roller. The weight of the tandem roller can varies from 2 to 8 tons and that of two wheel roller can varies from 8 to 10 tons. This smooth wheel rollers are most suitable for consolidating the stone sawing, gravel, sand, hard core, ballast and surface dressing and the speed and number of passes of a smooth wheel roller depends on the type of soil which is getting compacted. The optimum working speed has to be between 3 to 6 km per hour and 8 number of passes are adequate for compacting a 20 cm layer of the soil. And the weight on this drum can be further increased by filling the drum with wet sand or some other material. Generally the ground coverage provided by this smooth wheel roller is around 100%. is 100 percent. Here I would like to remind you for a sheep food roller it is not 100 percent, it is less than that. And one of the disadvantage of this smooth wheel roller is this causes the stratification in deeper layer due to non-uniform compaction. That means the soil compacted in different layers will have different density. So that therefore it will have some stratification. Another kind of roller is pneumatic rubber roller. This pneumatic rubber roller consisting of wagon with several rows of 4 to 6 closely paced tires. So here you can see these are the different tires which are 
present here. So, because of this, this is known as pneumatic rubber tire because air pressure is there. So, therefore, it is pneumatic and it since it is made of rubber, this is known as pneumatic rubber roller. This is consisting of different several rows of 4 to 6 closely spaced tires. The factors which govern the compaction are the tire pressure and the area of contact. The tire pressure can go up to 7 kg per centimeter square and the coverage which it can provide is around 80 percent. And generally 8 number of passes of the roller is required at an optimum speed of 26 to 24 kilometer per hour to achieve the maximum density. And these rollers are suitable for compacting well graded sands and fine grained cohesive soil near to their plastic limit. There is another kind of roller which is known as the impact roller. Here we can see the shape of an impact roller. In comparison to other methods, this shape is not circular. So, here what happens? This is towed away by wagon. Here we can see. And then when this roller moves, it will impact the soil. It will produce an impact to the soil. And because of this impact, the soil gets compacted. The impact is generated by rotation of a heavy weight which transfers sufficient amount of energy to compact the soil to a large depth. And the soil gets compacted by means of lifting and falling motion of a non-circular mass. If we use a smooth wheel roller or a, using a static pressure, generally the soil up to a depth of D1 can be compacted over here. But if we use a vibratory roller, the soil can be compacted to a depth of D2 which will be larger than D1. But if we use an impact roller, then the soil present up to a large depth can be compacted. Here in this case, it will be D3 and the depth of influence of this will be D3 is greater than D2 is greater than D1. And also when we compare with in terms of the density which we can achieve, if we compact the soil with a conventional compaction equipment, we get a compaction curve like this. We get a lower value of MDD at a higher value of optimum moisture content. But at the same time, if you use the impact roller, then we can achieve a higher value of density at a lower water content. So, this impact roller compact the soil due to its impact on the soil. When this roller moves forward, then because of the non-circular shape of this roller, it will fall from height on this surface and then compact the soil with a large amount of energy since it is a very heavily weighted structure. There are other kind of rollers are there which also can be used. One is a vibratory roller. So, this is something like a smooth uh, wheel roller. Apart from the smooth wheel roller, it will also have a some vibratory motion. These vibratory rollers are fitted with one or two smooth surfaced steel wheels of 0 0.9 meter to 1.5 meter in, dia in diameter and around 1.2 to 1.8 meter in wide. And the weight of this roller is generally 4 to 6 tons. And the vibration of this roller is generally produced by the rotation of an eccentric shaft present inside this roller here. And this roller generally used for comp compacting granular soil. with no fine in it. Another kind of roller which is known as grid roller can also be used. This roller consisting of a large number of grids which is made of steel bars and having a large number of square holes between them. So, these are the different holes and these are the grids produced by the steel bars. Due to these bars, 
it when it rolls over any soil it will exert a large amount of pressure on the soil therefore it can compact the soil to a great extent the weight of this roller can vary between 5 to 15 tons and the speed at which it can be towed can be from 5 to 24 km per hour and due to this steel bars it can provide high contact pressure. Due to this high contact pressure it can crush granular soil quite easily. Therefore, it is only applicable for the granular soil and crushing the large particles. So, these are the different type of rollers which we have learned. When we decide what type of roller we need to use, there are certain criteria we need to think of before de deciding what are the different factors affecting the compaction by rollers. So, these are the different factors which affects the compaction by the rollers. First one is the contact pressure. The compaction of a soil increases with increase in the compaction pressure. Then the number of passes, number of passes means how many times the roller is moving on the soil. Generally the compaction increases with increase in the number of passes, but after a certain number of passes the density will remain constant. However, after a certain limit the increase in the density with increase in the passes will not change significantly and therefore, the number of passes are generally restricted in between 5 to 15. Then the layer of thickness, the compaction increases with decrease in the layer of thickness. When you compact a soil of a large thickness and the same roller or same effort will be used to compact a less thick soil, then the density achieved here will be less and in this case it will be very high. However, if we take less amount of thickness, then we need to compact the soil several times. So, that will also not be good. Therefore, we have to have a optimum thickness to achieve the maximum amount of compaction. So, generally the thickness is kept around 15 centimeter and if the density we have to achieve is quite accurate then in that case we need to go for a small thickness of soil. Another thing which control the compaction is the speed of the roller. The compaction depends on the speed of the roller. If the speed of the roller is very fast then also the soil will not be able to get compacted. If it is very slow then also it is not economical. Therefore, the speed should be adjusted such that the maximum effect can be achieved. Next is the compaction by compactor and rammer. So, instead of roller also we can use the compactor and rammer to compact the soil. Generally, these are applicable for a small area and first we will look into the vibrating plate compactor. So, this is an example of a vibrating plate compactor. This vibrating plate compactor has a large number of vibrating plates over here and the soil gets compacted due to the vibration vibration of these plates and this is this is quite limited to small depth therefore it's limited to a small depth and primarily this is used to compact granular base cores for highway and runway where the thickness layer is very small and the soil gets compacted in this roller because of the vibration of the plates. There is another kind of compactor which we can, we can use is known as rammer. There are some cases when we cannot take any roller or compactor to different locations. So, for example, if this is a column and this is another column, the space between these two columns are very less. In that case, we cannot put a roller to compact the soil in between here. So, therefore, we can take a rammer which can be handheld and we can use this rammer to compact the soil on this area. 
So, this rammer is consisting of a stone or an iron block generally 3 to 5 kilogram in weight and attached to a rod. And this rammer also known as a damper is lifted about 0 0.3 meter and dropped on the soil to be compacted. Generally this is used for compact the soil adjacent to an existing structure or confined area where other methods of compaction cannot be used and it can be used for any type of soil. If we compare with the uh, different uh, equipment on what kind of soil or what kind of what kind of condition we, we can use, here we can see that smooth wheel roller and or static roller can use for running surface or base course or subgrade course and it is most suitable for well graded sand and gravel mixture and it is least suitable for uniform sands. Pneumatic roller can be used for road subgrade and this is widely applicable for coarse grain soil with fine contents, but it is least suitable for coarse uniform cohesionless soil. Sheep foot roller can be used for dams, embankment where we have a clay soil and generally this is applicable for soil with a fine content higher than 50 percent, but it is not suitable for coarse grain soil. Impact roller can be used for subgrade earthwork where large amount of uh, compaction is required and this is applicable for moist and saturated soil, but this is not applicable for dry and cohesionless soil. Tampers and rammers can be used where it will be difficult to access those compacted area. In that case, we can use the tamper and rammers and it can be used for any kind of soil. But in this case, the amount of compaction which can be achieved is less in comparison to the other methods. When we do the compaction, there is a kind of requirement that to what density and what moisture content it can be compacted. So, for example, for a road where the depth is about 0 to 0 0.5 meter, then the soil should be compacted at around 90 to 105 percent of the maximum dry density that is modified maximum dry density and the moisture content should be around plus 2 to minus 2 percentage. If the depth is more than 0 0.5 meter, in that case the dry density should be about 90 to 95 percent of the modified maximum dry density and again the water content should be around minus 2 to plus 2 percent. Small earth dam, the compaction density should be 90 to 95 percent of max modified maximum dry density water content should be between minus 1 to plus 3 percent, large dam it should be 95 percent of modified maximum dry density, moisture content should be between minus 1 to plus 2, for a foundation it should be 95 percent and the water content should be minus 2 to plus 2, S linings like a clay liner or it should be around 95 percent and the moisture content should be in the range of minus 2 to plus 2 percentage from the OMC. When we have different kind of soil or different kind of conditions, we can have this amount of water content. Say for example, for an expansive soil, generally the soil compacted on the wet side of the OMC to reduce the swelling. For a core of the earth dam, we need to have a lower value of permeability such that water cannot percolate through it. Therefore, we need to compact the soil on the wet side of the OMC. For a highway embankment on cohesive soil, the soil should be con compacted on the dry side of the OMC to achieve the higher shear strength and low compressibility. For outer shell of the earth dam, the soil should be compacted on the dry side of the OMC to achieve high strength, high permeability and low pore water pressure. So, this thing we need to remember that on what condition or at what location at which water content the soil should be compacted. If we try to understand about the acceptable criteria for the compaction, then we can see here if we plot the relationship between dry density and water content, suppose this is the ZAV line and on this line, if we compact a soil on this portion, then we will get a soil with a higher strength. On the same time, if we compact the soil 
on this portion will get a soil with a lower hydraulic conductivity. So, this zone is applicable based on the shear strength, this zone is based on the hydraulic conductivity. Now, when we decide to what conditions or what is the acceptable zone for compaction, then this will be the overall portion or the overlapping portion which satisfy both shear strength as well as the hydraulic conductivity criteria. Therefore, the soil has to be compacted on this side to achieve the shear strength as well as the hydraulic conductivity criteria. If we look into this plot, we can see this is a compaction curve, this is the gamma d max that is the maximum dry density and this is the 95 percent of gamma d max. If we are allowing the soil to be compacted on 95 percent of the maximum dry density, then we can see here at 2 water content, we can achieve this 95 percent of gamma d max. If we draw a vertical to the water content, we get point A and B. So, to achieve 95 percent of MDD, the, compacted, the compaction water content should be greater than A and less than B. That means, the water content should be within this zone to achieve the 95 percent of the maximum dry density. When we sp specify the density in terms of water content and the dry density, generally we have three different methods, the method A, method B and method C. In method A, it will suggest you about the minimum dry density to which it should be compacted. Say for example, this is a plot between dry density and water content for any soil. This is the MDD and OMC line and this is this line correspond to the 95 percent of MDD. Say for example, in this case, the soil has to be compact at 95 percent of MDD. So, therefore, this is the zone at which the density is less than 95 percent of MDD. Therefore, this zone is a reject portion and if we need to compact the soil to a minimum value of 95 percent of MDD, then this should be the acceptable zone. That means, the soil should be compacted on this zone. In method B, the soil has to be compacted in terms of the water content. So, here the water content is a criteria. Say for example, in this case, it is given that the soil has to be compacted at plus 2 to minus 2 percent of the OMC. If this is the OMC, this is the minus 2 and this is a plus 2 portion. So, therefore, this zone is the acceptable zone for compaction and the other zones will be the non-acceptable zone of for the compaction. In method C, the soil will be given a compaction criteria based on its density and the water content. Say for example, in this case, the soil need to be compacted at a water content of minus 2 to plus 2 percent and a density of 95 percent of MDD. So, only at this portion that can be achieved. So, therefore, the soil need to be compacted only at this portion. The other portion will be the rejected one. Therefore, when we compact the soil, it has to be compacted only on this portion. So, this is how the different three different criteria can be specified in terms of the density and water content. As I told you earlier, there are two kind of compaction, one is a shallow or surface compaction and second one is a deep compaction. In shallow compaction, we use roller, rammer or tamper for compacting the soil. So, whatever I have discussed all is about the shallow compaction. In the shallow compaction, only a shallow depth of the soil will get compacted. Generally, it will be around 1 to 1.5 meter of the soil which can get compacted using a shallow compaction. But whenever use, we use for a larger depth, then we need to go for a dynamic compaction. Whenever we have to go for a deep compaction, that is we have to go for a different type of techniques. In deep compaction method, 
the soil located at a large depth can be compacted. So, these are the different methods which uh, I will discuss one by one. The first one is a dynamic compaction. Here you can see this is an example of the dynamic compaction. In the dynamic compaction, a weight will fall on the ground and because of this weight and the impact energy over here, the soil get compacted. Generally, the weight of this uh, is varies between 6 to 172 tons and the height from which it will drop will be about 10 to 40 meters depending on how much compaction we are requiring. And the degree of compaction depends on the energy of the impact that means how what is the weight and at what height it is falling, the degree of saturation of the soil. If the degree of saturation is less then the soil will be compacted to a less extent. The permeability of the soil, if the permeability of the soil is less then the amount of compaction achieved will be less and the fine content. If the soil carries large amount of fine in it, then the compaction will be less. So, depending on all these factors, the degree of compaction in this method can also be varied. Next comes the vibro compaction. In this method of vibro compaction, the compaction is performed at a large depth using vibration and this is used to densify a saturated cohesionless soil. The degree of compaction achieved depends on many factors like the grain size distribution of the in situ soil and generally this is performed with a soil which having a fine content between 10 to 15 percent. If it is more than 10 to 15 percent then this method will not be applicable. We have to go with the other method. If we look into this plot, this vibro compaction is generally performed for this kind of soil that means gravel, stone and few sand contain. If the soil can contains fine particles which is will be more than 10 to 15 percent then we have to go with the vibro replacement method and this vibro compaction method is can be performed using a blasting or a vibratory probe and vibratory compactor. In loose deposit soil the vibration cause localized densification of the soil and load due to the shock is transferred to soil particles and therefore, the particles takes a more dense pattern over here and therefore, the soil gets compacted to a higher density. Next is the vibro replacement method. Vibro re replacement method is a technique of constructing st stone column through the field material and weak soils to improve their load bearing capacity and settlement characteristics. In this method, the vibration is supplemented by active replacement of the soil and the backfilling zone from which the soil has to be displaced. This kind of method is used for soil containing clay and silty soil. In this method, large sized columns of coarse backfill material are installed in the soil by means of special depth vibrator and this method improves the non-compactable cohesive soil by installing of load bearing columns as well as compacted coarse grain backfill material. So, in this method the first it hole will be made and then it will be filled with the soil. Next is a field compaction. The ratio between the dry density in the field to the maximum dry density in the laboratory is known as the relative compaction. So, this gives us an idea about how much the soil has been compacted in relative to the laboratory density. For a cohesive soil, 95 percent of the MDD standard proctor test is achieved using a sheep foot roller or pneumatic tire, ro tire roller. For a cohesion, cohesion less soil, 100 percent of the maximum dry density from modified proctor test will be achieved using a pneumatic tire rollers or vibratory rollers. This plot shows the relationship between the number of passes and dry density for different type of soil. For a single soil, if we take, if we plot a relationship between dry density which has been achieved with the number of passes which we can see. For a wet soil with increase in the number of passes, the dry density will increase and after attaining a certain maximum value, it will remain constant. With the further increase in the number of passes, 
the dry density will not increase. For a natural soil, if we will take, then after reaching a egg of passes, the maximum density will be achieved and beyond that, there will be no increase in the dry density. Therefore, for all type of soil, we can see there will be a certain number of passes beyond which there will be no further increase in the dry density. Therefore, we have to choose or select what is the maximum number of passes which we need to have in the field. Similarly, about the thickness of the soil, here we can see the different uh, layer thickness has been taken at a given water content. If we plot a relationship between dry density and number of passes, we can see here if the thickness of the layer is less, then a higher amount of dry density has been achieved at a less amount of number of passes. So, for example, in this case at 100 mm of thickness of the soil, this is the number of passes. For 200 mm, this is the number of passes and this is for 300 mm thickness, this is the number of passes. So, therefore, we can see here less is the thickness of the soil, the number of passes to achieve the maximum density will also be less. So, based on this, we need to select what should be the number of layers or what should be the number of passes and what should be the thickness of the layer which should be compacted. So, this is all about the compaction in the field. Generally, to, H, to know how much the soil has been compacted in the, or what is the density of the so soil in the field, we can measure the field density and we can compare with the laboratory density. The field density can be measured using two methods, one is known as destructive method in which the soil sample will be collected from the field and it will be taken to the laboratory to determine the density. Generally, these methods are the sand replacement method, core cutter method and rubber balloon method. Proctor needle method and there is a non-destructive technique by which we can measure the density in the field itself without uh, destroying the soil. This is nuclear density method and impact tester. So, these are the few methods by which we can determine the field density and we then we can find out the relative compaction. So, this is all about the compaction process. Next is a preloading. When you take a clay soil and when you construct a structure over it, because of its low value of hydraulic conductivity and high compressibility value, soil will be compressed to a large extent. And also the, to achieve about 90 percent of the settlement, it will take lot of time. In the preloading method, the amount of settlement as well as the time to time to achieve the 90 percent or a large amount of settlement will be decreased. In this method, a load will be applied to the soil before constructing any structure over it. So, this is applicable for highly compressible, normally consolidated clay soil located at a large or limited depth and which is expected to have a large consolidation settlement results from the any building which you are going to construct over it. And this preloading can further be enhanced by providing the vertical sand drains. Here I will show you the advantages of the preloading. Here we will take the soil on which the structure is going to be constructed. So, this is a clay soil and we will fill this soil or we, we will provide a surcharge over this soil. So, this is the total surcharge which we are providing. Now, the, pro the advantages of providing preloading is to number one to reduce the settlement. and 2 
reduce the time to achieve maximum settlement. So, in this method a load will be provided in the form of a surcharge load before constructing the actual structure. A plot between the settlement and time has been plotted for soil without any surcharge only with the load of the structure and this is with the surcharge load. So, when the soil is loaded with the structure or when the actual construction carried out on the soil without providing any surcharge, we can see this is the settlement time plot. And as we apply the structural load over here, the soil will get settled. And this is the time at which the settlement, the final settlement will take place. Let this time be T2. Similarly, when we provide a surcharge load, then we will get a time settlement curve like this one. Now, if we compare between the final settlement, here we can see we are achieving a final settlement at T2 time and this case we are achieving the final same amount of settlement at T1 time. So, this is the time for equivalent settlement with a surcharge load and this is the time for a total settlement without a surcharge load. If we compare, we can see we are achieving the same amount of settlement at a less time for uh, soil with a surcharge load and at a higher time for a soil without a surcharge load. Therefore, we can reduce the amount of time to have a large amount of settlement. So, generally it has two advantages. Number one, it reduces the settlement. Here we can see it is a clay soil over which we are going to construct the structure. If we do not go for a pre-loading method, then in that case if we construct the structure, the soil will have a large amount of settlement. Here you can see this is without pre-loading, we will get a large amount of settlement over here. Now what we will do is we will provide a surcharge load on the clay soil and after some time we will remove the surcharge load and then we will construct the actual structure. In that case we will get a curve like this one. So, if we compare the amount of settlement because of this two process then we can see the soil without a pre-loading undergoes a large amount of settlement whereas a soil which has been pre-loaded and then the structure has been constructed is having a less amount of settlement in comparison to the other soil. So, therefore, by pre-loading we can reduce the amount of settlement. Similarly, due to the pre-loading the strength of the soil will increase and we need to have a less depth of foundation in comparison to a soil which is not been pre-loaded. Therefore, the foundation depth can be reduced when we go for a pre-loading in comparison to the soil without having pre-loaded. Now, if we look into this plot, the load settlement along with the time curve has been plotted. In the pre-loading method, initially the a surcharge load will be applied. So, this surcharge load will be higher than the design load. Suppose, if this is the design load which is the load of the structure then we need to an additional amount of load of this. Now, if we are providing a this amount of load and recording the amount of settlement, then we can see the soil will settle very fast because the amount of load is very high. Then after reaching this point, what we will do is we will remove this load. As we remove the load, some rebound of the soil will take place and then again we will go for the construction of the structure. That means then actual design load will come. As we apply the design load over here, then the soil will again get compressed or settled 
but the amount of settlement over here is very less and the soil will reach to the final settlement. So, this is the final settlement for the design load. If we directly go for the structure without having a surcharge load, then the curve which we will get is this one. That means, the soil will be having a large amount of settlement without preloading. So, this will be the amount of settlement which the soil will undergo without preloading. And this is the amount of settlement which the soil will go with preloading. So, therefore, we can conclude that due to the application of the surcharge load, the amount of settlement will reduce significantly. Again, as I told you, we have to achieve two things. One is the less amount of settlement and second one at less time. So, here you can see the same example. This is the soil and with a surcharge load over here. So, with a surcharge load, the settlement which you are getting over like this one. After reaching this time here, the soil is not getting any further settlement. But if we do not allow a surcharge load, then the soil will get settled and after time T1, it will reach to its the design settlement value or the final settlement value. So, this is the time T1 and this is the time T2. So, T1 is the time to reach the design settlement without the surcharge load. T2 is the time to reach the design settlement under the surcharge load. Now, here you can see T2 is very less than T1. So, that means we are achieving the design settlement load at a less time. Therefore, the soil will not undergo any kind of settlement over here. So, we can prevent a large amount of settlement to the structure. Since when we apply a load to the soil, the pore water pressure will of the soil will increase. And as long as the pore water pressure has not been dissipated, there will be settlement occurring to the structure. So, this pore water pressure further can be removed quickly by applying sand drains. So, here we can see these are the sand drains which has been provided at regular interval. So, these sand drains are consisting of boreholes filled with sand and these holes may be formed by driving or jetting and the diameter are generally between 200 to 450 mm and spaced between 1 to 6 meter apart. When we provide this uh, sand drains, it will further enhance the rate of settlement and further reduces the time to achieve the design settlement. Here we can see here, this is a curve between the time settlement without surcharge or sand drains. Here, if we look into this curve, the soil is taking time T3 to achieve the fi final design settlement. If we provide only the sand drains, in that case, will achieve this curve and in this case, the soil will take time T2 to reach the final settlement. However, if we provide the surcharge load along with the sand drains, then we will get a curve like this one. At this portion, because of the removal of the surcharge load, there will be some rebound, but we will achieve the final design settlement at time T1. So, if we compare here, we can see the T1 is less in comparison to T2 and T3. Therefore, by providing sand drains, the time to achieve the design settlement will reduce further. This is how the settlement will take place quickly. When we take a soil and when we provide a surcharge load, the pore water pressure will increase and the pore water will try to escape from the surface like this. Now, in order to escape from the surface, it has to move to the 
drainage layer or the boundary over here. Now the soil has to move from this to this. It takes a lot of time for water to move from this point to this point to escape out from the soil. And depending on the permeability, the time will also vary. Now if we provide the vertical sand drains like this one, the time to reach this drains will reduce significantly. So here once we apply the surcharge load, the pore water will try to escape through this sand drains and instead of moving to this direction, now they will move towards the sand drains from where it can be removed. And as the water takes less time to reach to sand drains in comparison to this one, the time taken to achieve the compression of the soil or consolidation of the soil will get reduced significantly. Therefore, we can achieve a higher amount of settlement at a lower time or we can achieve the design settlement at a lower time in comparison to the soil with a surcharge load only. There are different advantages of vertical drains. It increases the rate of gain of shear strength of a clay. It enables the load to be applied more rapidly, thus a better use of the construction plan. In case of embankments, steeper slopes and provision for berms can be avoided. Lower amount of fill is required. Increased rate of consolidation can take place. Consequent saving of construction cost can be achieved. Increase in the rate of cons consolidation can take place because of the sand drains. Therefore, re the reduction in the time required for the primary settlement can be achieved. Structure or embankment can put into commission and use far earlier because of settlement it is taking place very quickly. The reduction in the cost for the maintenance will also be there. And also it will provide the stability to the embankment. So this is another method preloading by which we can achieve a lower amount of consolidation or we can achieve a higher st shear strength and less consolidation of a soil. And further the preloading can be enhanced by providing the sand drains. Next I will explain about the stone column method. The methods which I have described so far are mostly ap applicable for shallow compaction. That means it, it can be used to compact a shallow soil like soil located up to couple of feet from the ground surface. But when the soil consisting of a large compressible clay kind of soil or soft soil, then those methods of compaction cannot be used. In that case, we need to go for a stone column method. So in stone column method, as the picture suggested here, a hole has to be digged into the soil and then this hole will be completely filled with stones or large aggregates. And after filling this, we have to compact this uh, stone or aggregates in succession. Thereby, this stone or this crossed aggregates will be compacted and also it will be displaced radially to give a higher strength of soil. And this will increase the bearing capacity of the soil. So going by the definition, in this method, a cylindrical vertical hole will be made and then gravel or stones will be backfilled here and then it will be compacted by suitable device. And due to this compaction of this material, it will be also displaced radially. This will result in a densely compacted soil and this method is known as the stone column. So when we use the stone column method, there are certain limitation for this. Mostly this uh, method is applicable for inorganic cohesive soil, but if the soil is compressing of large depth of organic soil made of peat, then this method will not be applicable. And sometimes it can be used for loose sand to increase the density of the soil. And the main purpose of this method is to reduce the settlement and provide a stability to the soil. The load carrying mechanism in here is the local perimeter shear. And to reduce the settlement, the column should be extended through the soft soil to a firmer soil below. And since this uh, stone columns are filled with large coarse grain particles or stones, then it can also act as a vertical drain. 
and generally the typical design value for each column is like 200 to 300 kilo Newton for soft medium clays. These are the different installation technique we generally adopt in the field. First, a hole will be drilled into the ground using a different mechanism, mostly using a vibrator. Then once the hole is or the drill is made, then it will be filled with granular soil or stone and then those granular part soil or stone particles will be compacted and when we compact those granular particles, then we will achieve a column of a higher density and this will be carried out in layers. So, once we have to dig this hole, then we need to put this uh, stone aggregates here, then it will be compacted, then again the vibrator will be withdrawn and again the stones will be placed here, then it will be again compacted and similarly it will be compacted in layers and finally we will get a column which will be made of compacted granular fill or stones. So, this is known as stone columns. In picture you can see the stone column over here and once one column is made then several number of columns will be prepared. Then a layer of granular blanket of minimum 0.5 meter thickness is provided at the top of the stone column and generally the clean medium to coarse sand of relative density 70 to 80 percent is used and this granular blanket should be exposed at the periphery to the atmosphere for the easy dissipation of the pore water pressure. And we need to remember that the soil first has to be compacted in layers of thickness 0.4 to 1 meter in depth depending up upon the soil type and spacing of the columns. And the diameter of these columns are generally varies between 0.6 meter to 1 meter depending on the, the soil type and also filling material. Generally, the crossed rock of size 2 to 75 millimeter is provided as a filling material. However, sometimes mortar can also be injected as a filling material. And a square or triangular pattern can be used. This is a square pattern and also we can use like a triangular pattern. And generally, the spacing between these columns are kept around 1.5 to 3.5 meters. There are two different techniques by which uh, this uh, columns are made. One is the dry bottom feed method of installation. So, in this dry bottom feed method, generally a vibrator will be used to drill a hole. So, once this vibrator will be penetrated into the ground, then it will be withdrawn. Then once it is withdrawn for a little height, then the stones or granular soils will be feed through the, through the feeder pipe. Then this granular fill or stones will come here then it will be again compacted using the vibrator. Once this is compacted, this will move radially and also it, it will get denser and then once we achieve this, then again this will be withdrawn and again it will be filled with the granular fill or stones and again it will be compacted using the vibrator. So, in this method, the first step is the penetration that will be achieved by inserting this uh, vibrator here. Then the drill will be made and once the drill will be made, it will be withdrawn for a short height and then it will be filled with cross stone or granular soil and then it will be compacted like this. And once this compaction is carried out, then that pro process will be repeated to get a column of this shape. Then this process will be repeated to achieve the other columns nearby. This method creates a high modular stone column which reinforces the treatment zone and densify the surrounding soil. The other method is wet top feed method of installation. In this method of installation, it will use a vibrator and this vibrator will be penetrated into the soil due to its vibration as well as its uh, weight and also during the vibration jet stream of water will come out from here. So, this jet stream of water will cut the soil around this vibrator. So, therefore, the vibrator penetrates to the design depth due to the vibration, its weight and the water jet. Now, as the water jet cut the soil, it will produce a annular space between the soil and the vibrator. So, once this soil is drilled, then 
the stones or gravel will be fit through this annular space between the soil and the vibrator. So, here this will be fit and then it will move in where it will be compacted. So, an annular space will be created by jet between the soil and the vibrator. Then the granular material or stones will be fit through its annular space. This material will then fill the void space at the tip of this vibrator as the vibrator is lifted. Then the vibrator will be lowered and then it will densify and displace the stones here. Once this is densified, then we will get a stone columns like this. This process will be repeated for different layers to achieve a final stone column. This method has different steps. First, penetration and flushing using a stream of jet water. Then the column will be constructed, then it will be completed. So, these are the different steps by which uh, the stone columns can be installed in the field. These are the different references and bibliography. Thank you.